Amen. Turn to Exodus chapter 17 this morning. And I want to preach on not on my watch. Not on my watch. I'm going to be awake, alert. I'm going to be on point with God. I'm going to be ready, prepared, and not afraid of the enemy. Somebody say amen. Exodus chapter 17 and verse 9. Now Amalek came and fought with Israel in Rephidim, and Moses said to Joshua, Choose us some men and go out and fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses said to him and fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill and so it was when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed, and when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands became heavy, so he took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. And Aaron and Hur supported his hands, one on one and the other, on the other side, and his hands were steady until the going down of the sun, and Joshua defeated Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. Father, thank you today for your wonderful presence we've already felt. Thank you for the Holy Ghost. Move in our lives and give us strength in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. God bless you. God is calling each and every one of us to be on watch. We need to send out a very clear signal to the enemy of our soul. He's not going to have his way with you or your family or those you love. We need to tell the devil, not on my watch. Greater is he who dwells in us than he who dwells in the world. So we have nothing to be afraid of. We need to engage the enemy. It's time for the church to become who it is. It's a powerful, mechanized war machine that is authorized by heaven to tear down the gates of hell. Nobody on this planet is authorized by God to advance against the gates of hell but the church of Jesus Christ. And God wants us to amp up and to tune up and to get strength and to go forward in the name of the Lord. We find this battle was... Uh, was a, a powerful thing because here is Joshua, the young man with all the young warriors down in the valley fighting the battle, hand-to-hand -hand combat. And they fought these godless nations that they dispossessed. And as they fought against them, the battle raged on the ground, but the white battle was won in the heavens. The battle is waged in this earth, in Bellflower, in Compton, in Cerritos, but it's won in the heavens. And it doesn't take a whole army, it just takes one. Moses was one old man, over 80 years old, but one old man on a mountain with his hands up, praying, interceding, was greater than all the forces of Amalek. The victory wasn't won by Joshua and the skill of the soldiers. The victory was won by the old man on the mountain. You are more than a match for the enemy because God in you is greater than the world. 
And the devil spends all of his time trying to minimize you and depreciate you and tell you that you're canceled, you're in, your influence is done, you're just an old person, you don't matter. As long as there's breath in your soul and you can turn it to heaven, you're a fighting war machine and you're more than a match for Lucifer himself. No weapon formed against us will prosper and all those who rise against us will fall in the name of Jesus. Our weapons are not flesh and blood. They are the power of God, the Holy Spirit that flows through us and one person can turn an army. One person can make a difference in a nation. One person can turn the flight and make the difference in in the battle that we're in. Don't let the devil depreciate you. Don't let the devil minimize you, marginalize you. Don't let him tell you you don't matter. You matter. You're a giant killer. Come on, put your hand above your head and say, I'm a giant killer. Hallelujah. We need to say what God says about us. We need to quit listening to the enemy of our soul that tries to tear us down, and we need to hear what the Holy Ghost says. As long as there's breath in you, you you can take the battle to the devil and you can more than match his power. Hallelujah. That old man on the hill made all the difference for the battles down below. There must have been thousands and thousands of soldiers engaged in hand-to-hand -hand combat, but that old man with his hands up, hallelujah, and when he ran out of strength, two men stood beside him, lifted his hands, and as long as his hands were lifted, come on, hallelujah, this is the posture of victory. This is an extreme attack of the devil. When we lift up our hands, demons get nervous. When we lift up our hands, Satan starts chattering. When we lift up our hands and begin to pray in the Holy Ghost, that devil is defeated. He can't stand five seconds of a child of God praying in the Spirit. We are more than a match. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I'm sick of the devil trying to marginalize God's people and make us think we're nothing. We may be few in number, but we're mighty in power. It's not our power. It's his spirit, says the Lord of hosts. We need to engage the enemy. Let me ask you a rhetorical question. Is it time to pray yet? Is it time to pray yet? Is it time for you to get on your prayer bones, engage the enemy, and whip him? Is it time to pray yet in your life, in your marriage, in your home, in your finances, in your children, in your grandchildren? How bad does it have to get before you finally get on your prayer bones? Is it time to pray yet? One of my favorite speakers, I watched his podcast this week, and he made some astounding facts and showed some video clips. He said in Texas, one of the largest aerospace companies sent a memo out to all of their thousands and thousands of employees that said they will use the gender pronouns. They will fill these forms out. They will call people by their preferred gender name. If they don't do it, they lose their contract with the federal government. Your job is gone if you don't use the right gender pronoun. The Biden administration recently told schools they will not receive funding for lunch money if they don't use gender pronouns and teach the children. They're going to lose their federal money. Good Morning America a few days ago in their morning show, you would think there would be something else that they could do, but they had a whole big, you know, two or three hundred people in the studio audience, and they brought out an 11-year-old drag queen, a little boy that thinks he's a girl and dresses like girls, and he came out prissing and dancing down this red runway, and the people all clapped frenetically and happily and were looking at each other, and, and they interviewed the parents. We're so proud of our son. He's decided that he's a drag queen, and we're so proud of his choices. He's one of the first, he's one of the youngest to come out and to make this statement. Good morning, America applauded, the audience applauded it, the, the people who were the head of it applauded, applauded it, and they even brought drag queens out 
uh, men who dress like women and interviewed and talked to the boy and encouraged the boy to be like them. This is the nation that we have become in America. Is it time to pray yet? You're going to keep sleeping? You're going to keep going to bed when you ought to be on your knees? It's time to wake up. He told of a church in Texas, a supposedly, quote, Christian church that invited drag queens to come and speak to their children in their church, talk to them about their lifestyle. I'm wondering how far it's going to go before we get on our knees and do some damage to the powers of darkness. Somebody say amen. God keeps speaking the importance of this, of people who will pray. We can, one person can turn the tide. One person can make a difference. Daniel was just one man. He caused war in heaven. He caused all kinds of governmental changes in government. We can change this nation. If my people, which are called by my name, if America will turn back to God, we can have revival. We can have a great awakening. We can see God. God is not through with us if we'll turn back to him. Somebody say amen. amen. Hallelujah. The Lord gave me a poems at one point in my life about 10 years ago. The Lord started giving me poems. And I wrote about two dozen poems. And I don't know why it stopped. I guess the Holy Ghost thought I did enough. I just write them when I get them. But one day I was praying and the Lord gave me this poem. I just want to read it to you. It's real short. It's called Somebody. Somebody. And it says, somebody needs me today. Somebody needs the prayers I pray. Somebody's slipping and sliding away. And they're depending on me. Though they don't know that prayer is what they need. Somebody's calling today. And I can hear their soul and the Holy Spirit say, Pray, pray, pray. Why? Because they're going to be changed. Somebody say, amen. amen. The Lord spoke to me a couple of weeks ago and said, tell the people. Many of them have cried out to me and called out to me faithfully for family members. Tell them that it's done in heaven. <laughs> oh, I got so much joy when he said that. Tell them it's done in heaven and it's going to manifest on earth. You're going to see it with your eyes, but I've already secured it in heaven. Somebody say amen. They're a goner for sure. It don't matter if they want to be saved or not, they're going to be saved. It don't matter if they want to go to heaven or not, they're going to heaven. They're a goner. It's a done deal in heaven. Somebody say amen. Hallelujah. And since the Lord spoke that to me, I praise him over my family members that I've prayed for and interceded. I praise him and I say, thank you, Lord. It's a done deal. And I feel so much confidence and joy when I pray like that. I just praise God. He has heard my request. Reminds me of old brother Tucker years ago when he, his pickup was worn out and beat up. And he said, God, I want a new pickup. And I don't have the money and I want you to give me a new pickup. I wore that pickup out building your church. And it's all dented and rusted and I need a new one. And he said he interceded to the Lord several months. And one day the Lord said it's done in heaven. It's done. He said from that moment on I quit praying about a pickup. And every day he said I'd go in and have lunch. His wife would fix lunch and he'd say, honey, let's thank God for our new pickup. And she'd say after a few weeks, Richard, are you sure you heard from God on that? It's been a couple of months and we haven't seen. No, nope, no, nope, no. Nope. God said, God said, it's a done deal. I'm getting a new pickup. Let's praise God for it. So she'd lift her hand, praise God, Lord. Richard's got this faith. And he said, you told it to him. Amen. Almost a year went by. One day a man called him in his church and said, uh, Hey, I just wanted you to come over here to this car dealership. I'm buying a new truck today, and I need some advice on some things. 
and said, you're pretty good with finances. He said, okay. So he drove over there and he said, he sat down in this salesman office and this salesman looked at Brother Tucker and said, okay, what color do you want? He said, me? He said, I'm here for him. What color do you want? And the salesman said, no, you're getting the truck. And the man looked at him and said, the Lord woke me up and told me to buy you a pickup today. He said, it's mine? He said, yeah. He said, I want a white one with everything on it. I figured if God was going to give me a truck, I might as well get everything I could. He said, I told him it's not going to be cheap. I'm getting everything. He said, get what you want. Somebody say amen. He used to come over here and visit with me and take me to lunch and say, you want to see my truck? God bought me right there. That's it. I drive it every day. How many of you know that God hears prayer? How many of you know God answers prayer? How many of you know God will tell you things are done in heaven and they're going to happen on earth? How many of you will lift your hand and say, I honestly believe God has showed me and answered me already in the heavenlies and I'm just waiting on the manifestation of it. Come on, let's praise him this morning. God has heard the prayer of his people. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Show our slide if you would. Praise God. There are some benefits about prayer I wanted to talk to you about real quickly. One of them is that prayer gives birth. Prayer gives birth. When you pray, you give birth to things. Hallelujah. Prayer's never wasted. It's never empty. It's never useful. It's not useless. It's not vain. Prayer works. It brings birthing. When Zion travails, sons and daughters are born into the kingdom of God. People are not brought into the kingdom without prayer. People that slide off into hell all the time, it's because nobody's praying for them. If somebody's praying for them, heaven is going to invade that person's life. Somebody say amen. Prayer gives birth. Prayer prevents. I like this. Prayer prevents the devil from having his way. What did Jesus say to Peter? He said, you're in trouble. Satan desires you. He wants to sift you like wheat. He's got a systematic plan to destroy you. And he's implementing that plan. Think about that. Jesus knew everything Lucifer was up to. But, but, I have prayed for you. <laughs> I've prayed for you that your faith fail not. And when you are converted, isn't that interesting? He'd been a disciple for three years. He still needed to be converted. Some of you have been in this church 20 years. There's still some parts of you that need converting. <laughs> Come on. Hey, Amen. Somebody cut you off and you, those four-letter words still slide out. You, you need some conversion. <laughs> I won't go any further. I'll just let you fill in the blanks. <laughs> Prayer prevents. It interferes. It cuts off. It overwhelms the enemy. Number three, prayer gives legs to the church. Hey, where'd you get these points? The Lord just spoke them to me. He said, tell them, prayer gives legs to the church. The only movement the church has is in the spirit. If the Holy Ghost isn't there, there isn't any movement. It's all ornamentation. It's in word, but not in power. Nothing really supernatural happens. Prayer gives legs to the church we're the only organization authorized to go and advance against the gates of hell. We advance on our knees because prayer gives legs to the church, makes life. Prayer gives air to the church. I love this one. When we pray, we don't stay on the ground, we go up. <laughs> Why do they drink? Because they're depressed and they want to get away. They want to go away. They want to get above it. Well, guess what? It's a toxic drug, and it's not going to help you. It's going to depress you worse. But prayer is not toxic. Prayer 
lifts you up into the heavenly realms in Christ. As Paul said in Ephesians 1, we've been exalted by the Holy Ghost. We, we fly above. We go up above and beyond. Hallelujah. The network of principalities and powers are right here in the second heaven. But when we pray, we go up above them. Amen. We enter peace and rest and joy. This is where mysteries happen. The Bible says when we pray in tongues, we speak mysteries. This is all done in the air. When we pray in the Spirit, the Holy Ghost it takes our spirit up in the air, and there are mysterious things that happen. Amen. And I don't need to know what the mysteries are. It's up to God to take care of all of that. All I know is it's powerful and it works. Amen. Prayer in tongues is the authorizing of the Holy Ghost to do whatever he sees best in your life. When you pray in tongues, you're saying, Holy Ghost, do whatever you want to do. I'm giving you authorization. I'm authorizing you, Holy Spirit, to do whatever you want to do. Somebody say amen. amen. I'm amazed how that my brain does not work on his level. I think I'm pretty smart. I know a lot of things. I know what needs to be done spiritually. And I pray in the Spirit and the Holy Ghost comes on me and he starts talking to me about something way off out and left. I say, God, we're dealing with this. Here's my issue. And he starts talking to me about something completely unrelated. And I said, that, that doesn't make any sense, not to you, but it does to heaven. And it's what's needed. And you do what I tell you to do. Somebody say praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. One time many years ago, I was praying in the spirit. And there was a man down here around the altars. And I was praying for people. And I thought I was praying in tongues for those people. And this man came up to me after church. And he said, I understood what you were praying. I said, really? He said, yeah, from my home country. I understood. And I said, tell me, what was I praying? I was praying for these people that I had a burden for. So I was, was I praying about their needs? He said, nope. Was I praying for somebody in the church? Nope. What was I doing? You were praying for a little town in Europe. For the Holy Ghost has a burden for many souls that live on one street. And you were praying for them. I thought I was praying for the people over there in the tongues. My tongues didn't have anything to do with those people. <laughs> do you understand? You speak mysteries. It, it's not your understanding. It's God's understanding. And he's applying. He's, you're authorizing him to do in you whatever he wants to do. Isn't that a beautiful thing? I think that's wonderful. I authorize the Holy Ghost. Pray through me any way you want to. Whoever you see needs it. Whatever it is, let me pray and be effective in the name of Jesus. Give the Lord a hand clap this morning. Amen. Hallelujah. Intercession does one thing in two ways. The Bible says it builds up the wall that's broken down and it fills in the gap in the wall. What does it do? It builds up a wall that's broken down. When I pray and intercede around that person, there's a wall that comes up and the devil can't have his way. When I pray in the spirit, the gaps that have been torn down by the enemy and the enemy's going to come in and destroy that person, the prayer fills in the gap along the wall and puts a wall of fire there and the devil loses his entry point into that person's life. Don't quit praying for your family. Don't quit praying for people. Your prayer is the difference in their eternity. Come on, let's stand together this morning. I want you to come up here to the front and stand. We're going to pray together as the church. We're going to intercede for people this morning. Hallelujah. And we're going to stand in the gap and make up the hedge. Hallelujah. They need you. They know instinctively that you make the difference. They don't admit it because they're in the darkness and they're running from God. But they know 
how powerful your prayers are. They know you're making a difference. They'd be dead already if God didn't have you as an intercessor. So I want you to come up here today and stand.